This conference will now be recorded. Uh, I am really delighted to be joined by David Cole, Nicole Moyer, Myers, and Richard Barnhorst uh, to take a look at uh, initiating the John Howard Society Week with an interesting panel on what the Youth Criminal Justice Act uh, can teach the adult uh, system in terms of reform. And uh, David, may, without further ado, why don't I just hand it over to you and you can explain the genesis of this interesting project. Uh, thank you. And thank you uh, to Catherine and others at the John Howard Society for, uh, for uh, doing this. I think it's a, it's a good idea. Um, I am a, a, a criminal adult and youth court judge in Toronto. And the particular youth court that I happen to sit at in Toronto is the second largest youth court in the country. Uh, for those of you who know Toronto, it's the entire west end of the city and virtually the whole of the north end of the city. So we, our intake uh, has been and continues to be huge. Because of that, we have a, a grouping of uh, uh, judges who do a lot of youth court work. And one of my colleagues who can't be here today, Justice uh, Andrea Tuck Jackson and I, had the idea that uh, uh, since April the 1st, 2023, marks the 20th anniversary of the Youth Criminal Justice Act, it might be an idea to have a look at what lessons can be learned uh, for the adult system from the Youth Criminal Justice Act. And we have uh, arranged uh, through the good graces of Professor Kent Roach, who is the uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the uh, uh, Criminal Law Quarterly, which is probably the, uh, the uh, best known or certainly the most eminent uh, uh, criminal law journal in the country to uh, publish a special issue of the uh, Criminal Law Quarterly sometime in 2023. We don't know yet when. And to that end, Justice Tuck Jackson and I have uh, communicated with a number of folks who are experts in these areas across the country, and we have commissioned nine and hopefully 10 papers uh, that are going to uh, feature in this, uh, in this collection. And we're going to talk to you today about three of those papers. Um, and I just want to tell you what some of the other ones are. Oh, oh, though we, for a variety of reasons, we weren't get, able to get people to speak to them today. In no particular order, um, we have a paper on what lessons uh, need to be learned from the application of uh, the Youth Criminal Justice Act to Aboriginal youth, and how, if anywhere, how, how, what we can learn from that and uh, apply in the adult system. Um, it's a, an interesting paper because uh, it has a lot of uh, uh, hard data, which uh, is uh, quite unknown in this area. The second paper that I, I personally uh, uh, find very interesting is that uh, Professor Carla Cesaroni at uh, in it was a prof in uh, Toronto or in the Toronto area, and colleagues have done uh, uh, a paper looking at trends around the world with respect to whether or not the age of the Youth Criminal Justice Act should be changed in some way. Uh, she has found that approximately 20 jurisdictions in the world, plus a number of uh, American states, have realized that the lessons that are being learned from uh, brain development theory are that uh, uh, and I guess any one of us who works in criminal justice can, knows this inferentially, that the, uh, the, the adult brain is not uh, fully formed until somewhere around the age of uh, 25. So a number of jurisdictions have said, well, how, how do we deal with that? How do we think about that? Some have by statute uh, written in that uh, judges are to consider this. Some even have different sentencing uh, modalities uh, for uh, for uh, youth in this position. Uh, some others have done things by policy. And so uh, Professor uh, uh, 
Cesaroni and her colleagues have looked at these and have suggested that uh, maybe the time has come to uh, look at this in the Canadian uh, context. That is somewhat related to a paper that uh, has been done by a law prof at uh, Western University, which he's writing about how the preamble to the YCJA and the statement of pur purpose and principles can be applied uh, with the emphasis on individualized sentencing, which the Supreme Court of Canada has uh, told us is very much to be the norm. And he uses the example of, unfortunately, of uh, people who are afflicted with various forms of fetal alcohol syndrome and how do we accommodate that within the context of individualized sentencing. A couple of the other papers that I'll tell you about, we have uh, a Crown and a Defence Council in Toronto who are planning to write about how lessons learned and not learned about the treatment of youth from racialized communities can be, and in some cases should not be, applied to adults from similar communities. Uh, in some parts of the country, we now have these enhanced pre-sentence reports, which arise from uh, an adult decision in Nova Scotia called Anderson, where uh, uh, the more you look at, uh, the more data you get uh, about uh, people uh, from uh, racialized communities, the better you can tailor your sentencing. And this is a lesson, of course, for, uh, for uh, uh, Gladue uh, 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 writers when, in those provinces where they exist. We also have a paper looking at how statements are taken from uh, young people under the uh, Section 146 of the YCJA. Uh, st statements to be admitted into evidence uh, against young persons can only be admitted into evidence if statutory criteria are fulfilled. And there is some suggestion that this should also be applied as it has been in other countries to the taking of statements from adults. Uh, because the taking of statements from adults is a much more a diffuse uh, um, area and spends a lot of time in the courts uh, figuring out whether or not uh, these things were uh, voluntary within the meaning of the authorities. And some other countries have decided to do it a different way. Um, a couple of other uh, papers. Uh, one is a Crown and Defence Council uh, looking at... Uh, uh, what are called Section 34 reports, which are often very, very fine uh, psychological, psychiatric reports in the youth context, and how these can be uh, applied to the adult context. Just very quickly, in the adult context, although a judge may order a mental health assessment for bail purposes uh, or for fitness purposes, uh, the provinces reacted to uh, uh, this uh, uh, when the YCJA came in uh, because they didn't want to uh, pay the costs of having to do this at sentencing. Well, the experience with these reports at the, uh, at the, under the YCJA over the last 20 years have proven to be excellent, and so may, perhaps the time has come to look at applying this to the adult context. And the final person who is not here today is a professor at the Dalhousie Law School who, with a colleague, is uh, looking at Nova Scotia's extensive and long-standing experience with various forms of youth diversion and how this might be ad adapted to inform adult uh, diversion, which is very much in its infancy uh, in many parts of the country. So today um, we have uh, three speakers. We have uh, uh, Mr. Richard Barnhorst, who is very, very much um, uh, someone who is uh, has been fundamentally involved with the YCAJA long before its inception. He was one of the people who was centrally involved in writing it. And um, he's going to talk to you about um, how you get a piece of legislation through Parliament. And that's very, very important because it's all very nice to talk about changes, um, but uh, how do you actually uh, do that in reality? Uh, uh, Dick will be followed by uh, Nicole Myers, who is a, uh, a, uh, a professor of sociology at Queen's University, who is very much becoming Canada's bail expert. She will blush when I say that, but it's uh, very true. She is writing more about these things and is doing more 
good quality hard research. And she's done a very interesting paper for this collection about lessons to be learned by the adult system from youth bail. When those two folks are finished, I will tell you very briefly about uh, uh, my paper, um, um, which has some sentencing ideas. Uh, if you have any, at the end, we hope we'll have time for some questions. Um, if you have any questions, uh, would you? There's a chat box which uh, I think is up at the top right-hand corner of your screen. If you have a question, put it in there, and at the end of it, we will try to uh, get to uh, some of your questions. So, Dick, uh, let me turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, David. Uh, I hope it's okay, but what I'm going to talk about includes what you mentioned but it it goes quite a bit further into some other areas just so we all know that ahead of time so the title of of my paper is called achieving restraint in the use of the criminal justice system canada's youth criminal justice act as you probably know the the ycj came into force in 2003 and it has helped to bring about remarkable and in some areas huge changes to the youth justice system the legislative provisions in other words the wording of the act itself appear the provisions appear to have been a significant factor although not the only factor in the ycj's success in that it achieved its policy objectives a major objective of the YCGA was to achieve greater restraint in the use of the criminal just, youth criminal justice system throughout it. Under the act, the system has undergone what I would call a fundamental reorientation toward a much more restrained approach at key decision points. The central question I address in my paper is, what lessons can those interested in achieving greater restraint in the adult system learn from the YCJA. In answering this, the general approach of my paper is to show the differences between the YCJA provisions, the specific wording, and the criminal code provisions in three key areas. Third, <coughs> use support. Secondly, sentencing. And thirdly, pretrial detention. In each of these areas, the paper also goes on to discuss the experience under the YCJA and the code um, for nearly 20 years. And then it compares the YCJA experience with the adult experience. And lastly, the paper concludes with a discussion of some, of some factors other than the legislative provisions that appear to have had an impact on the success of the YCJA, including, as you'll see, uh, some discussion about, as David mentioned, um, how to get this, how did this act actually get through Parliament? So I'll turn first to uh, police charging and diversion. As was the case under the YOA, the criminal code permits the use of alternative measures. However, it does not encourage or promote their use. The experience with alternative measures under the YOA strongly suggested that stronger legislative direction was needed to encourage greater use of extrajudicial measures. Now, what's the code say? I, I, I'm obviously not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but I'm going to give examples of differences between the code and the YCJA. The, the criminal code's guidance to police and prosecutors regarding alternative measure with adults is simply to be satisfied that it would, quote, be appropriate. And it is, quote, not inconsistent with the protection of society. These provisions, to say the least, are relatively vague in comparison to the YCJA provisions. As I mentioned, time doesn't permit a detailed discussion, but in contrast to the minimal and vague code provisions, the YCJA includes several provisions that give specific guidance to police and prosecutors regarding extrajudicial measures and using them instead of the court. For example, Rather than simply defining, as the code does, alternative measures as, quote, measures other than judicial proceedings, the act sets out a range, a whole range of extrajudicial measure options, as well as introducing the concept of community conferences for use by police and prosecutors. 
The law also states that extrajudicial measures are presumed in law to be adequate to hold a young person accountable if that person has committed a nonviolent offense and has no previous findings of guilt. The law also states extrajudicial measures are presumed to be adequate for administration of justice offenses, with some exceptions I can go into later if you want. And lastly, I'll just mention that the law states that the repeated use of extrajudicial measures with the same youth is authorized. So you can use the same extrajudicial measure or extrajudicial measures two, three, four times with the same youth, which is very different from what happened under the YOA. Now, Rhea, uh, if you could just put up the chart on charging, the uh, charge rates, it's called. Well, maybe we can't do that. <laughs> I'll go ahead. Um, oh, wait a minute, maybe we have it. I'm not sure you're going to be able to read that, but um, so I'd like to turn now to the experience under the act uh, as it related to charging and uh, relates to charging and diversion. Over 20 years, the rate of charges against young people in this country has dropped by 76%. During the same 20-year period, the rate of charges against adults also dropped, but by only 20%. So the decrease under the YCJ was almost four times the, the decrease in the adult system. It also appears that the use of post-charge diversion of young people by prosecutors has increased significantly, while post-charge diversion of adults um, has been stable. It's also noteworthy, I think, that there's been a reversal in police charging practices over the years. Under the YOA, almost 60% of young people who were chargeable were charged, and around 40% were not charged. Under the YCGA, that has reversed to now a majority of young people who are chargeable are not charged, 55% and 45% are charged. I'll now move to what about the use of the court? And Rhea, that goes to the next chart called Youth Court Cases. There's been a huge reduction in the use of the court under the YCJA. In, in the year 2019-20, the number of youth court cases was 71% lower than the last year of the YOA. Adult court, court cases also declined but the decline was much less, about 18%. Now the YCJ objective was not only to reduce the number of court cases, but to reduce the use of the court for these less serious or minor offenses. In other words, the idea was to reserve the court for more serious cases. And if we look at the data, the proportions of youth court cases of violent crimes and property crimes have reversed. Property crimes in the youth court have dropped from 40% to 27% of the court's caseload. And violent crime cases have increased from 26 to 46% of the court's caseload. Administration of justice offenses have also dropped significantly. These stats indicate that the work of the youth court has shifted to more serious offenses, which was the whole idea. Unlike the youth court, the mix, this kind of mix of uh, types of cases in the adult court caseload has remained almost unchanged, fairly stable. Now, an issue, and uh, Rhea, if you could put the slide up called youth crime rate, that'd be great. An issue raised by the increase in the use of extrajudicial measures and the decrease in the use of the court, as well as a decrease in custody and pretrial detention, which I'll get to later. The issue is, that's been raised is whether these changes in the operation of the system have been accompanied by an increase in youth crime as some critics predicted, especially as it was going through parliament. The enactment of the YCJA has not resulted in an increase in youth crime. Rather, the overall youth crime rate has decreased by 69% over the last 20 years. I'm not saying, just to be clear, that the YCJ caused that decrease. I think the important point is that if you take a chance and make these kinds of changes, it, uh, at least the YCJ experience is that it doesn't uh, increase the crime rate. 
Similarly, the severity of youth crime was lower in 2020 than it was in the latter years of the YOA. The severity of overall youth crime over the last 20 years has dropped by 59%. So these stats provide a possible lesson for the adult criminal justice system. Reducing the number of police charges, increasing the use of diversion, and including and in reducing the use of the youth court did not result in youth, uh, an increase in youth crime, and it allowed the court to be reserved to be reserved for more serious offenses. Now I'd like to move to sentencing quickly. Um, Rhea, there's a chart called Youth Court Custodial Sentences and Adult Court Custodial Sentences. There were serious concerns about sentencing under the YOA, especially the very high use of custodial sentences. For example, the youth incarceration rate was higher in the youth system than the adult system, and about 80% of custodial sentences were for nonviolent offenses. The YCGA introduced several new sentencing provisions intended to address these problems, and I'll just uh, give a few examples. One is a statement of the purpose of sentencing. In the YCGA's purpose of sentencing, the the promotion of rehabilitation in the sentence is a requirement, not an option of a youth sentence. The purpose also states that a youth sentence is intended to contribute to the, quote, long-term protection of society. It's not a short-term focus. It's a long-term protection of society. The Supreme Court of Canada has stated that this means that protection of the public under the YCJA is not an immediate objective of a sentence, but rather the long-term effect of a successful youth sentence. In contrast, the criminal code sentencing purpose does not make rehabilitation an absolute requirement of a sentence. Unlike the YCGA, the code does not require that the sentence focus on the long-term protection of society. Now, turning to sentencing principles, as another example, the, the Act makes several sentencing principles mandatory, whereas similar principles in the code are optional. For example, the Act states that a sentence must be the least restrictive alternative that will achieve the purpose of sentencing. In contrast, the Code states that, quote, an offender should, not must, should not be deprived of liberty if less restrictive sanctions, quote, may be appropriate in the circumstances. This provision is fairly weak, and the phrase appropriate in the circumstances is clearly open to a wide range of interpretations. Also, the code sentencing objectives of a general deterrence and incapacitation do not apply under the YCJA. But probably the most significant difference between the sentencing provisions of the Act and the criminal code is Section 39, which prohibits the court from imposing a custodial sentence unless one of four criteria is met. The criminal code has no comparable provision that restricts all custodial sentences. In general, Section 39 restricts custody to violent and serious repeat offenders, which is not the case under the criminal code. And unlike the code, it provides much more explicit direction to the court regarding when custody may be an appropriate sentence. Now, turning to what's happened under sentencing in the last 20 years, under the YCJA, youth custodial sentences dropped by an astounding 91%. In other words, only 9% of sentences compared to uh, uh, the 100% under the uh, YOA are now being uh, imposed in, in, under the YCJA. In contrast, over a slightly different time period, but still over a 14-year time span, adult custodial sentences declined by only 7%. Now, what about incarceration rates? The youth incarceration rate, oh, uh, Rhea, that's the next uh, slide, incarceration rates. The youth incarceration rate, which represents the number of young people per day in both sentence custody and detention, has declined by 83% since the last year of the YOA. The adult incarceration rate has also declined, but only by 23%. And now moving to pretrial detention or the bail stage of the of the act. And Rhea, there is another slide called number in detention. Thanks. There's some very significant differences between the YCGA grounds for detention and the criminal 
code grounds for detention. Again, just by way of example. First, under the act, the court has no authority to detain unless the youth is charged with a serious offense. And that's an offense punishable by five years for an, for an adult, five years or more. Or the youth has a history that indicates a pattern of previous findings of guilt or outstanding charges. Secondly, unlike the code provisions, the secondary ground, which concerns public safety in the YCJA, allows detention only if there is a substantial likelihood of a serious offense if the young person is released. Again, serious offense means an offense for which an adult could be subject to five years or more. In contrast, the code refers to a substantial likelihood of any criminal offense or any interference with the administration of justice, which is obviously a much lower standard. Thirdly, unlike the code provisions, the tertiary ground, which refers to maintaining confidence in the administration of justice, the tertiary ground in the YCJA can be used only if the youth is charged with a serious offense, same definition, Secondly, there must be a finding that the first two grounds of flight risk as well as uh, public safety do not apply. And even then, it can only be imposed if there are exceptional circumstances justifying detention on this ground. Now, I think it's noteworthy that the most common administration of justice offenses are outside the meaning of serious offense. So what that boils down to is this ground isn't going to be used for administration of justice offenses, at least in general. Uh, there also some comment, there's some real differences on conditions of release, which I'm just gonna jump over because of time constraints. And lastly, um, under the YCJA, the onus is on the Crown in all cases. Reverse onus provisions of the code do not apply under the YCJA. So now what, what has been the experience under the YCJ with respect to detention? First of all, the number, and we've got that chart up if you can see it, that's the top one. Uh, the number of young people in detention over the last 20 years has dropped by 77%. In contrast, the average number of adults in detention did not drop. It increased by almost 50%, 47 to be exact. Rhea, the next uh, slide, I believe, yes, covers detention rates. The youth detention rate, which is the number of young people in detention per 10,000 in the population, has also declined. The youth detention rate in the last year of the YOA was actually higher than the adult rate, but by 2020-21, it had dropped by 70%. In contrast, the adult detention rate did not drop. It increased by 14%. All of this is to say these provisions probably had something to do with these dramatic changes in the way the, the system is operating. Now I'd like to turn to some other factors that contributed to the act's success. I think it's important to recognize that there are many factors beyond the scope of my paper that help to explain the YCJ's success. For example, Cheryl Webster, Jane Sprott, and Tony Dube in discussing the successful decarceration of youth in Canada have identified several broad sociocultural and political factors from the 1960s to the 90s that helped to initiate changes in youth justice and really set the stage for the legislative reforms of the YCJA. I'm not getting into those, but I am going to get into some additional factors between the years 1998 and 2003 that I think were critical to the success of the act beyond the actual legislative provisions. And I think they provide some lessons for anybody who's actually interested in making similar reforms in the adult system. These factors fall into three groupings that I made. One, the legislative drafting approach or style, which sounds I'm sure deadly boring, but it's an important factor. Secondly, the range of implementation efforts prior to the YCJA, so implementation, and factors that helped in the passage of the YCJA by Parliament, so getting it through Parliament. So first, turning to legislative drafting, 
What is it about the approach to drafting in the YCJA? One is clarity in the policy objectives. In contrast to the YOA and the criminal code, the act is relatively clear about what the legislation is intended to achieve. It's not perfect, but it's a lot clearer than the YOA and the code are. Secondly, structuring decision-making through explicit wording. The provisions in this act, especially at key decision points, are much more explicit and directive than comparable provisions in the criminal code. And when I say directive, I mean, it isn't just better being explicit and specific about what you say. It, it should reflect the policy objective of the act, and that's what the direction part is about. Thirdly, the drafting approach was to create a new statute rather than amendments. This sent a message to judges and other youth justice professionals that rather than tinkering with the existing rules, a new legal approach to youth justice was being taken. Fourth, system-wide reform. The drafting approach looked at the entire system and coordinated the drafting um, to take into account what's happening at the front end as well as the back end of the system and the impacts these things might have. And lastly, and I'm a bit hesitant to raise this one, and um, Catherine, you'll understand this. Uh, the last one is the drafters. Who is drafting this bill? Within the federal government's, and this is true of legislation generally in my experience, within the federal government's broad policy direction on youth justice reform, there was considerable scope regarding how it should be turned into specific wording, specific legislative provisions. So lots of decisions were being made about wording. And without going on, I'll just say in short, if you're looking at reforming the adult system, who was holding the pen matters. Now, the next category is implementation of the YCJA. One factor here was the length of the overall reform process. The process of developing this act took roughly seven years from establishment of a federal provincial task force to passage of the act in, in 2002. And of course, the government then delayed the passage of the coming into force for one year to allow for planning and implementation. During these years, the department carried out extensive consultations with provincial governments, officials, and others. So long before the act came into force, youth justice professionals, I think, became in general very familiar with the issues the new policy directions and the legislative proposals, which allowed for a much smoother transition to the new approach to youth justice. People were ready for it, I think. Secondly, was the Federal Provincial Territorial Cost Sharing Agreement. This agreement came in, was, in, uh, was reached a, a few years before the act came into force. And the agreement's financial incentives for the provinces to spend the money in ways that were consistent with federal policy objectives helped to shift provincial programming and practice toward the act's policy objectives well, well before the act came into force. So again, program and practice was kind of in line by the time the act came into force in general. Thirdly, professional education programs. There was a wide range of educational programs, including, for example, a five-day judicial education program in collaboration with the National Judicial Institute. And also, there were all kinds of various educational materials prepared for various audiences, uh, including, for example, something called YCJA Explained, which was a comprehensive online explanation of the act for youth justice professionals. There was also special project funding during this implementation period. The department established the Youth Justice Renewal Fund to provide special funding for innovative pilot projects and their evaluation prior to the act coming into force. It also included capacity building projects, specifically for indigenous communities. And lastly, under implementation, I, I, I think it's only fair to say that the provinces and the territories were key in implementing, in implementing the act. They play, obviously, a very important role in implementing, in implementing the YCJA in the achievement of the Act's objectives. And I could go on. I'll, I'll stop that there. And lastly, the third factor is, how did this bill get through Parliament? I remember being at a, at a, a conference in somewhere in Europe, and it was an international audience, and, and the 
the, uh, there were several lawyers from the United States and they said, after my presentation, this is before the law came into force, but just explaining what it was going to be about. They said, how in the world did this ever get through a legislature? So it was, obviously it's easier in Canada than the United States, I think. So anyway, the, the point here is the very best law reform proposals or ideas are obviously of very limited value unless you can get them enacted. Therefore, I think another lesson of the YCJA is to understand factors that help to explain how it got through Parliament despite opposition from several critics, including some provincial governments, such as the Ontario government and political parties. These factors include the following. I'll try to be brief. One, areas of agreement. At a general level, there were in fact areas of agreement, and one in particular was a broad consensus that the YOA needed to be changed. But how it get, would be changed was a whole other issue, but at least we had agreement that change was necessary. Secondly, there was majority government, which is obvious if you're trying to get a bill through parliament. Thirdly, the YCJA contained an approach, a policy approach that we might call two-pronged in that it made a clear distinction between how to deal with serious offenses and less serious offenses. And this was maintained throughout the parliamentary process in explaining the act. And the purpose was to counter the perception of some members of the public and the media that youth justice legislation was simply too lenient with young people who committed serious offenses. And I'd be glad to answer further questions about that. Fourth was the issue of research and statistics. The department received significant help. Of course, we were interested in it too, but significant help from academic criminologists in obtaining research information, statistical information. And it's noteworthy, I think, that during the long parliamentary process, critics of the bill did not produce contradictory research or statistics in any way to counter the basis of the YCJ proposals that was based on, in many respects, uh, these research, this research and statistics. And lastly, I'll just mention, I don't wanna, it takes too long to explain, but uh, the act was criticized. I see this in a, as an advantage, actually, the size and complexity of the YCJA. It was criticized as being too big, too complex. People had trouble reading it, supposedly. And, but, um, I think despite the size and complexity of the bill, it may have actually helped the passage of the bill. And I'd be glad to answer questions uh, about that. And just some closing comments um, as a conclusion. Stepping back, we look, at, look at, at the youth and the adult system. I think it's fair to say that greater restraint in the use of both the youth and adult criminal justice systems has been an objective stated by federal liberal governments and others for many decades. And the um, Webster, Sprott and Duke paper lays this out very clearly, how, how far back talking about restraint um, goes. Although there are some signs of increased restraint in the adult system, and I pointed out the small decrease in, a, in uh, adult custodial sentences, Although there are some signs, as I say, of restraint in the adult system, they pale in comparison to the evidence of much greater restraint in the youth system. There are also areas in which the youth system has moved toward greater restraint, while the adult system has moved in exactly the opposite direction. For example, 47% increase in the number of adults in pretrial detention, while the YCJ had a very significant drop. So, after so many years of calls for restraint in the use of the justice system, the criminal justice system, the YCJA and the factors related to its success have changed those aspirations of restraint into a reality of restraint in law and practice. So for those who are interested in bringing about similar results in the adult system, it appears to me that there are many lessons to be learned from the YCJA's legislative provisions specifically, also the process of, of its development, and finally, its implementation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dick. Um, um, for those folks who signed on a little late, if you, have, uh, if you want to put a question, could you please put it in the chat box, which I believe is up in the top right-hand corner of your uh, screen. And now we turn to uh, Nicole Myers. 
right. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the invitation to be here to speak with you today. Uh, Ria, do I simply go ahead and hit click share to uh, to be able to let me hold up. I, I, I'm, I'm receiving a variety of instructions here. Bear, bear with me one moment. Yeah, just click on share. You're good to go. Unfortunately, share is not coming up as a clickable option uh, in my view. You can try now. Uh, Rhea, I think we've lost audio. You notice that this uh, is being I, recorded. Are, yeah. can you, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, I will just have you, you go ahead and put up the presentation then as uh, I don't seem to be able to access it from here. Rhea, did you get that? Nicole is asking you to put up the presentation because it's not working on her end. Yeah, I'm just doing that. Great, thanks bud. Great. All right. Thank you so very much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, okay. So today I'm going to be sharing a few comments from the from the paper that I've written for the special edition in Criminal Law Quarterly. Um, and really what I've been trying to think about as, as someone who studies bail and pretrial detention is the kind of lessons that we can learn from the very uh, clear success of the YCGA and how we might be able to translate those into options for how we think about law reform specifically for adults. Uh, next slide. Uh, I don't want to repeat much of what uh, what Richard Barnhorst walked us through, so I'm going to sort of take where he finished as sort of a leaping point uh, for what the data that I'm going to walk you through today. Um, but sort of just so that it's a reminder at the forefront of everybody's mind is that the YCJA did bring in a rather dramatic reduction in the use of custody, and that we see that reduction in both the use of pretrial detention as well as in sentence custody. And one of the sort of clear reasons why the YCGA has been so very successful is it provided very clear and explicit guidance to decision makers. And that that clear and specific guidance was then dovetailed together with extensive consultation education and training for decision makers so they very clearly understood the objectives of the law and how to shift their discretionary decision making. One of the other elements in terms of not only providing very clear directions from the onset was also to provide some additional options to facilitate re release. And all of these sort of came together to then significantly change routine decision making. So what we're looking then at is sort of an expected or an entrenched culture of decision making was able to be radically changed through the YCJA. Next slide. Now, I want to provide a bit of context of the bail situation for adults, and then I provide the similar one for youth. One of the important things for us to remember is that across Canada, in um, when we look at those who are in our provincial institutions, 67% of those who are in our provincial institutions are there in pretrial custody, rather than having been sentenced and con con sorry, convicted and then sentenced to be there. If we look specifically at Ontario, we're looking at proportions sitting around 77%. And these proportions are long-standing. Indeed, uh, it was in 2001 where in Ontario for the very first time, our provincial jails held more people who are to be presumed legally innocent than those who have been convicted and sentenced to be there. And if we look across Canada, this proportion shifted around the 2004-2005 time period. Now, not only have these populations shifted so that we have such an enormous proportion of our provincial jails holding those who are to be presumed innocent, is that if we look then at the rate with which we use pretrial detention, this has more than doubled in the last 40 years. And that the actual raw number of individual bodies, the people that are sitting in custody on any given night, has quadrupled in this time. Next slide.
Now, one of the interesting things when we look at young people is that we've also seen a similar shift in the constitution of the population, meaning the proportions that we see in sentenced custody and the proportions that we see in pretrial detention. Now, it's important to remember that the number of youth in pretrial detention has absolutely plummeted in the last 20 years, decreasing by over 77%. And in this time, the remand rate has also fallen from 49 per 100,000 to 11 per 100,000. So it's important to be mindful that while the proportions in custody have shifted, we overall have seen an absolutely dramatic drop in the number of young people that we're holding in custody generally and those that we're holding in pretrial detention specifically. When we look then at the numbers, one of the tricky things that comes up is that the numbers are getting so small. And so it's important then to sort of think about what is sort of explaining the shift in these proportions, because despite there being a huge drop in the number, a huge drop in the rate with which we're using pretrial for young people, nonetheless, the proportions have shifted. So if we're looking at those who are in custody right now, Approximately 56% of young people who are in custody are in pretrial. And in Ontario, this is sitting at around 77%. But what we have to be sort of mindful of is that the, what is sort of largely driving this has been the decline in both the sentence and pretrial population, but there's been a more significant decline in the sentence population than there has been in pretrial. But nonetheless, the shift in proportions is something that we should be concerned about. And in my mind, it's a similar reason why we should be concerned about it for adults, is that when we think of the purposes of our jails, what we're trying to do, who it is we're sending there, there seems to be something sort of peculiar about a circumstance where we're seeing so many people serving time in custody at the front end of the system and much fewer people serving time in the system after they've been convicted and sentenced. Next slide, please. So if we think then about what the YCGA contained that was particularly unique and impressive is that it was explicitly designed to really reduce over reliance on custody. And it was straightforward in sort of acknowledging that this was precisely what the objective was. And included therein then were a number of legal requirements, protections and hurdles to custody for young people. One of the things that makes the youth system distinct from the adult system is that for youth, it, the Crown bears the onus to demonstrate why their detention is justified. And I'm going to return to this a little bit later in the context of adults, but we see sort of an increasing number of particular offenses or circumstances in which the accused bears the onus, where they're the one who has to demonstrate why they ought to be released rather than the Crown bearing this onus. We also heard from Richard that your, the young people are not to be detained or have conditions of release imposed that are meant to be a substitute for child protection or around their mental health or other social measures. That we created a number of justifications or what we might refer to as hurdles to custody. And I haven't included all of them here, but a couple of those that I think will be particularly relevant for adults is thinking about look, focusing at detention or reserving that for those who have been charged with a particularly serious offense or who have a history in the past of a finding of guilt. And then we created sort of additional pieces that need to be thought of by decision makers that have to be met on the balance of probability. Prob pardon me, but on a balance of probabilities, that no condition or combination of conditions is able to then address the risk that the young person poses. And then the variety of pieces that then have to be met in order to make this particular determination. And all of these were then designed very clearly to be around trying to limit the number of young people that are being held in custody. The YCJ also created the responsible person and the responsible person is a bit like a surety and now sureties are possible for young people and for adults, but a responsible person is not something that's available for adults. And they're meant to act in a somewhat similar capacity, though they are a distinct entity from a surety and they're meant to be sent somebody who's going to be able to promise the court that they're going to supervise the young person, that they're going to make sure they come back to court, don't commit further offenses. And that this additional provision was created with the objective to try to, again, try to facilitate facilitate release for young people who may otherwise be detained. Next slide, please. Now, what I want to do is I want to walk you through a bit of data that is specifically about bail and pretrial detention. Now, this data comes from the Ministry of the Attorney General in Ontario, and there's two different components that I'm going to share with you. Um, one is data that is publicly available from the uh, 
from the ministry's website. And this looks at cases that are disposed in the particular calendar year that I have listed at the bottom. And so in this way, the decision making is a little bit lagged, meaning that, for example, the proportions that we're seeing in 2020, those are cases that concluded in 2020. So it's looking back at the bail decision that may have been made in a few years prior to that. With that knowledge that there's a bit of lag then in this data, um, I was also able to request their live bail data. And when we see that, I'll remind you of this, but what the live bail data is looking at is going, what was the last bail decision made in that particular calendar year? Um, and the reason why I'm gonna present that to you today is because we're better able to capture what happened um, with the, in the context of the pandemic and some of the shifts that the disposed data is going to lag a little bit behind in. But what I want you to see here and what I am trying to do in the paper is make some comparisons between adults and young people. And here then we see that a fairly sizable proportion of cases ultimately start their case trajectory in bail court. And we see this is sitting higher for adults where we're sitting over 45% of all adult cases end up with their first appearance being in bail court rather than the police exercising their powers to release and having them appear in court at a later date. For young people, we certainly see this as a lower percentage, but not dramatically so, sitting at about 37% of young people in the most recent data available started in bail court. Next slide, please. These proportions, however, have to be sort of thought of together in mind with the acknowledgement that the number, the raw number of adults and youth cases coming into bail court has shifted over time. And as you can see here with the orange line marking young people, this change has been absolutely dramatic, plummeting from a high of, well, oh, and I, pardon me, I should mention that the youth are using the, uh, using the, um, the scale on the right hand side of your screen and the adults are using the left. So the number of young people, the young person's cases having exceeded in around 17,000 cases coming in and starting in bail court in 2008, having dropped to just over 2,000 cases a year starting in bail court. So we're looking at a bail court dealing with a dramatically fewer young people coming in in terms of the volume of cases. However, when thinking of the cases that the police are then looking at, still a very sizable proportion of those cases that they're deciding to go ahead and charge are starting in bail. And this should make some sense to us if we think that we're sort of focusing our attention on those that are more more serious or more risky that those proportions would still be high in terms of deciding that those are the types of cases that we want to hold and let the court make the decision as to whether or not they should be released next slide Okay. So this is then looking at disposed cases. So recall then there's a bit of a lag time and these are referring to cases that were finished in this particular year and their bail decision may have been made that year or may have been year made the year prior. And I present here data from 2019 and 2020 wanting to be able to demonstrate that while the pandemic of course changed all things, it had not quite the level of dramatic impact on some of these measures that we may have expected. And so I wanted you to be able to demonstrate this consistency. And what I've highlighted here, and I want you to sort of notice, I've got the numbers in the raw form at the top and down below have converted this into percentages, is that as far as young people go and most current data is that we formally detain very few young people. In 2019, 80 young people had their detention formally denied to them. And in terms of 19, in, in 2020, this was 79 young people. When we look down below and we're comparing them between adults and young people, we do see that we release more young people on bail who apply for bail, sitting at 73% in 2019 and 70% in 2020 of young people that applied for bail were ultimately released. Looking then at the percentage that were ultimately detained, we also see that young people are detained less frequently than adults are at 1.6% and 2.4%. Now, what I then highlight for you again in red, and what I want you to sort of keep sort of at the forefront of your mind, is what I refer to as limbo cases. Now, these are going to be people who have finished their case processing, and it's, so the case has been resolved in whatever way it's going to be resolved, but they never addressed the question of bail. They were never formally released, but they also weren't formally detained, but nonetheless, they remained in custody until their charges resolved. And now for some people, that may be relatively quickly. You've made the decision that you're simply going to plead guilty shortly after arrest and you never address the question of bail. For another group of people, they may spend a long period of time in custody before their charges are ultimately withdrawn. And now when we see, look at adults, we are looking at almost 40% of adults, and this is relatively consistent over time, are in this limbo space. 
And when we look at young people, we might go, well, that's not so bad. We're looking at a little over a quarter of young people remain in limbo without having a bail decision made. But what I think is sort of important to remember is that the folks that are in limbo, they may not have been formally detained, but nonetheless, they are being held in custody. And so when we think then about the very small number, small proportion that are formally detained, it seems to be a marker to us that things are working particularly well. That only makes sense if we ignore those in limbo. When we bring them together, we can then see that there's still a sizable proportion of young people and adults who are detained in custody. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, these numbers, will, they'll look somewhat similar to you, but there are a couple of sort of distinctions that I want to point out to you. And what the one of the shifts here is that we're looking at live bail cases. So these are going to be decisions that were made in the year that you're looking at. Um, and when I requested this data, I was able to get tw uh, 2021. So we've got things updated a little bit further into the future. And again, here, you'll see that the trends are largely similar. A very small number of young people are formally detained. In terms of the percentage, it's relatively low. But I highlight here that group in limbo that I was just talking about. And what we see here that in terms of 2021, the most recent year available, almost 50% of young people whose um, the bail decision that was made in that year was simply a non-bail decision. There wasn't one to be recorded, indicating that in the context of the pandemic, it appears in the last two years, but we've seen quite a shift and have seen sort of an increase in the proportion of both young people and adults who are in this space of limbo, adding that to those who have been formally detained. It's a very large number of people who are sitting in pretrial detention. Next slide, please. Now, wanting to provide you a bit more than a simple snapshot, and I wanting to be able to demonstrate this over time, we're going back to adults, and here it is, we're looking at those cases that were ultimately disposed in that particular year. And I'll point your attention down to the line at the bottom, the percentage of those um, who were detained, and you see that this remains relatively consistently low over time. Um, and indeed, you might remark that in, with the exception of rather recently, it has been declining over time. And then we'll see then that those who have been released least has increased marginally over time, but nothing terribly significant. And that I've included the yellow line, which merges together those who are in limbo and those who are detained, so that we've got a better sort of a clear depiction of the, what proportion are ultimately being held in custody. And that for adults, we're looking at roughly 42 to 45% of adults are being held in pretrial detention, either as being formally detained or remaining in limbo. And that again, while there's been some fluctuations over time, it's remained relatively consistent. Next slide, please. Looking at youth, then we see a rather different trajectory where over time we have progressively been seeing more and more young people being released on bail and fewer young people being detained. And even then, when we look at the trajectory lines indicating those who are being held in limbo, we also see that there has been a bit of a decline here and something that we should be considering positive and completely in line with the objective of the YCGA to keep young people out of custody. More are being released, fewer are being detained. Yes, we have young people in limbo, but that this has been largely declining. But then I want to show you the live data in the next slide. And this is where we're going to see the very sort of radical shift in trends from the last year or two that we wouldn't see in the disposed data for a couple of years time lag. And again, here we're seeing a replication of a fairly consistent line of folks being detained, a fairly consistent line of people who um, are, for example, pleading directly out of bail court. But we're seeing quite the upshift and quite the downshift starting around the in the context of the pandemic in 2020, where we're seeing the, the trend line drop rather precipitously for the percentage of adults who apply for bail who end up being released and a rather significant incline in the proportion of adults who end up remaining in pretrial detention in limbo without a bail decision being made. Next slide. And we see the same thing for young people. And I think this is then a point that we want to be sort of putting our mind to as an area of particular concern. Whereas if we look over time, you see that the trend lines are really quite consistent. And I, and I do acknowledge that the live bail data it doesn't have, follow the same sort of length of trajectory that the disposed data does, but the lines are relatively consistent until we hit the pandemic. 
And we then see that we've had sort of a real shift in decision making with a quite a significant decline in the number of young people and the proportion of young people who are being released. And this uptick then in those who are remaining in limbo. Not that we're necessarily formally denying bail to any more young people as we see the line across the bottom is very consistent. But we do seem to be seeing quite a dramatic shift then in those who are going to be, those who are held in limbo without a bail decision. Next slide, please. Part of what I want to sort of point out, because when we think about concerns around the administration of justice and charges of failing to comply with the bail order, we know that these types of things are more likely to occur the more conditions young people have imposed on their release and the longer that they're subject to those conditions in the community. And while we know that most young people that apply for bail are ultimately released, as we see case processing times increase, there's a longer period of time that young people are at risk in the community of accumulating further charges of failing to comply. We also know that the police treat these kinds of charges quite seriously, make it less likely that someone's going to be released on bail. Sorry, le less likely that they're going to be released by the police and more likely that they're going to be held on bail. What we're then demonstrating here is again, the similar sort of line of those who are detained, but when the most serious charge a young person faces is against the administration of justice, we're seeing a rapid sort of uptick then, again, in the context of the pandemic of those who are being held in limbo. And when we combine that together with those who are detained formally, we're looking at almost 45% of young people who have their most serious charges being failing to comply are being held in custody in one way or the other until their charges are resolved. Next slide, please. So we're facing then a variety of enduring challenges that we can look broadly speaking, the YCGA has been a dramatic success on many measures that we think are, as being particularly important and has reached it, its objective of reducing the use of custody. But the difficulties that we face are still nonetheless present and warrant further attention. That when we think about the proportions that are in pretrial, we're looking at all the young people in custody, a high proportion are still in pretrial detention. And with cases taking longer to resolve, this is a concern for us because those who are detained are spending longer periods of time detained. And those who are in the community, they're spending longer periods of time subject to conditions, putting them at risk of accumulating further charges of failing to comply. We also know for young people, many charges are ultimately withdrawn. And while this might ultimately seem like the system working precisely the way it should, and that the end result of being free to go is a positive outcome, young people are making many court appearances before that decision is being made. While we see that very few young people are formally denied their bail, we have a non-trivial proportion of young people who remain in this limbo space. And that while they may be in limbo and not formally detained, they're nonetheless being held in custody. So in my mind, we need to think of them together then with those who have, are having their bail formally denied. While most people are released into the community, we know it often comes with supervision and conditions of release that may be difficult to comply with, especially over extended periods of time. Surety provisions continue to be a challenge as a surety is simply not someone that's available to all young people. And while there is this additional provision to be able to use the responsible person as another mechanism to keep young people out of custody, we're advised that it is rarely used and that it may also, it still ends up coming back to some of the challenges, the questions we have about the appropriateness of requiring a surety or a responsible person for a young person to be released and what this sort of, what, um, what payback this has in terms of enhancing public safety. The other thing that we need to be mindful of is that the, the improvements and the changes that have been experienced with the YCJA have not been universally experienced. There are some young people that have not been able to experience the advantages and changes that have come with the YCJ, particularly Indigenous young people, Black young people, other than young people from other racialized communities are overrepresented in the system and continue to experience longer times to, to reach case resolution. And what this then does is this starts to replicate then the disproportionate in contact with the criminal justice system that we see for adults that we also are seeing for young people with racialized populations and this really should signal to us the systemic and, and as well as the magnitude nature of this problem next slide please now a number of lessons then that i think can come from the ycj in terms of how it is we engage in law reform for adults if we acknowledge then that in our system we have a culture of risk aversion and a, a culture of adjournment sort of well established in the adult and in the youth court 
So we need to think about how do we change this culture and changing culture is incredibly difficult. And indeed the kind of sort of tinkering or amendments that, are, that sort of target the edges of the law are simply not going to be substantial enough to engage the kind of sustained and substantial changes in decision-making that we're looking for. In the absence of clear framing principles, guidelines and thresholds, the result is we have a tendency to make more conservative risk averse decision making. And some of this is absolutely understandable. People are reluctant to be the one that makes the bail decision that ends up turning out badly. But we also have to be mindful that decision makers in the criminal justice system are making the best decision possible with the information available. We are very not terribly good at accurately predicting risk. And this is exactly what we're asking decision makers to do. So if we're very serious about wanting to bring about systematic change, we need to reconceptualize bail. And what this means is stepping back and completely reevaluating what it is we are trying to achieve at the bail stage to bring about this clean slate mentality that we saw with the YCAGA that has then been able to demonstrate dramatic change. We need to be completely explicit about what the principles, objectives, and directions are for decision makers. What do we want them to do? What do we want them to value? How do we want them to weigh the information that's available to them? One of the other things that we may want to consider doing is re removing reverse onus provisions um, so that it is always up to the Crown to demonstrate why an accused person ought to be detained. We might also think about making the bail decision for adults similar to how we make it for youth focus on those who are the most serious and the most risky and let those that are most minor and least risky simply go and don't bring them into the system in the first place. This will allow those who are working in the courts to better focus their attention and resources on those who are indeed the most risky. And we might also think about how to develop specific and principled hurdles to custody similar to what we see for young people. Again, being able to not necessarily completely curtail the decision making discretion people have, but to provide some better guidance and direction for how it is that decision is supposed to be made with the end objectives in mind. Next slide. Okay. The last thing I wanted to comment on, because I, I sort of I couldn't not speak to this, is, isn't something that cont is contained in the in the paper. But many of you, I'm sure, have been hearing about our arguments being made that we need to make our bail system more strict, more severe. That we have that the tragic incident that happened with the shooting of the OPP officer um, is the result of an overly lenient bail system. And so, what the solution is is that we have to tighten up the law. And in my view, I think what is being proposed is the wrong way to go about this. I think what we need to do is engage in law reform that is both principled and evidence based rather than being reactionary to an undoubtedly tragic event. As I've referenced, we do not have an accurate rate way to predict risk generally or specifically be able to predict the risk that someone's going to go on to commit a serious or violent offense. Any of our attempts to predict risk are generally unreliable, as well as discriminatory against particular populations. Taking on a more restrictive or risk averse decision making is going to result in detaining more people that do not actually pose a risk and will have a limited impact on public safety. If we think then about the law, we already have mechanisms to keep people in pretrial detention where appropriate, including reasons for public safety. Now, keeping a person in pretrial detention removes them from the community and may provide us with this short term public safety. And understandably, that may be something that people are seeking. But what we have to be mindful of is that that protection is temporary and that it may actually undermine longer term public safety objectives. We have to remember that custody is criminogenic. It makes you more not likely to commit an offense. Even short periods of time have this kind of an impact. Last slide, please. So what should we do? In my view is to remove reverse onus provisions as these are not a guaranteed or effective way to achieve public safety. It makes it appear as though we're doing something without it actually bearing out with the consequences that we're hoping for. We need to have a thorough and principled review of the law that brings together all criminal justice system actors as well as academics and community stakeholders. And one of the things we might wanna think about focusing our attention on is how to improve the efficiency of case processing and access to justice, including restoring and increasing funding to legal aid. 
we want to think about how we can reduce both the number of people in pretrial detention as well as how long those folks remain detained and how long people are subject to conditions in the community, all of which puts us at risk. We want to set up and encourage the police to use judicial referral hearings, which may then have an impact on the volume of cases that start in bail. And by reducing that volume, we can sort of stop some of the adjournment churn that happens in bail court and allow the actors there to focus their attention on those that are most serious and most risky. And above all, to me, the question is one then of priority. We as a community, what are we most interested in, short term or long term public safety? And then let's make sure we make decisions that involve pursuing the latter. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nicole, for an excellent presentation, as Dix was. Um, I'm going to be very, very brief in uh, uh, describing my paper because it's uh, much more, uh, there's no data in it. How's that? Um, what I'm interested in is this, that uh, typically in Canada, a judge imposes sentence, and that's the end of it. If somebody doesn't like the sentence, they have to go to appeal. And that's a long convoluted process that can take months, is expensive, and ties up three judges of the appeal court for hours at a time. Other jurisdictions uh, have different processes. For example, in Europe, the best developed one is the French one, where you have the juge d'administration de la peine, the judge who administers the penalty. In other words, there's a judge who sentences, and then there's a judge who uh, actually administers the sentence, figures out how long does this person need to be in custody? Has he or she improved such that their custody could be reduced? Uh, can they be released on, uh, uh, on some sort of uh, conditional release, et cetera, et cetera? Those systems exist all across uh, Europe in a number of uh, countries. And I gather also that they, it exists a fair amount in uh, South America as well. Surprisingly, there is a concept like this in the YCJA. Dick Barnhorst tells me that it actually is a holdover from the, the dreaded Juvenile Delinquents Act. But it's Section 94 of the YCJA, which authorizes a sentencing youth judge to revisit custodial sentences imposed on youth. Obviously, there need to be criteria, but it seems to me that that was designed in part as a much more expeditious way of getting judges uh, involved in the sentencing process. And my paper is an argument in favor of doing more research about uh, what happens under the YCJ. There are only about 130 cases a year, and that data is pretty uh, squiggly anyway. Um, but uh, I'd like to see us uh, devote some thought to applying this in the adult uh, context as well. So that's what my paper is about. Now, I see that nobody has signed into the chat box. So I think uh, we're done, Catherine. I don't know if you want to say anything uh, in conclusion. Um, well, I'm seeing Susan Haynes thinking that it was incredible, I think, and thanking us, which is great. And I'm sure a lot of people got a lot out of this. I think it's very timely to think about reform uh, that has been successful, uh, to see what, what, um, what underlay that, because we are looking at some I think some unfortunate short-term fixes in, in um, the adult system, and it's not going to be pretty. And I think the more we get evidence and suggestions of alternatives that could work better out there, uh, hopefully uh, they will see the light of day at some point. But it's been a great experience for me. I'm so happy to hear that the Youth Criminal Justice Act has achieved so many of its objectives. And um, I want to thank you all very much. It was, it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Happy John Howard Society Week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.